inviting us to uh, give you an address tonight on the Streets of Sarnia project. Uh, the lady that introduced us, if, uh, if she doesn't mind, uh, I have one um, correction for her. She described me as a Sarnia lawyer, and uh, I just want for the record you folks to know that I was a Crown attorney. Uh, I always said I always I always said one of the benefits about being a crown attorney was the fact you could deny being a lawyer. <laughs> so, uh, what we're going to do here tonight, we're going to review some of the aspects of the streets project, and as we're doing it, uh, feel free to put your hand up and ask some questions. Okay, we want to make sure that you guys hear uh, what you want to hear. Okay. I'll turn it over to my partner, Tom, here at this point. Thanks, Randy. Um, <clears throat> I guess it was in November 2014 that uh, we decided uh, that we would try to do uh, something about the Sarnia Streets. Um, prior to that, Tom Slater, whom you've met, I know, who's the author of the uh, Sarnia War Remembrance Project, well, Randy was instrumental in helping with the research, and another fellow and I helped do the editing. So we were having a celebratory uh, drink at a local establishment, and Mayor Bradley mentioned that, um, you know, the, the Sarnia streets could use some revamping. There had been a, a book completed in 1988 by uh, George Smith, a, a well-known historian in Sarnia, uh, but he said there were several new streets at the time. Oh, there it is right there, The Origin of Sarnia Streets, 1988 by George Smith. And um, as it, fate would have, uh, that day I had been driving in with a fellow from Curling and Forest, and he was driving me to my place on Hollands Avenue, and we passed Hay Court. And I said, Roger, I said, Roger Hay, was that street named after your family? He said, yes, my dad was a builder, he built it. And he said he also named a street after me, Roger Street, a street after my sister Beverly, a street Connolly after my aunt, and these three streets, Capri, Fair Lane, and Bel Air, after the three types of uh, split-level homes that he developed. Well, that night we met, and so when uh, Mayor Bradley asked if we consider, I'm not even sure if he asked us, he said, he threw it out there, and it was a topic that I'd always been interested in, having grown up in uh, Sarnia. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I was talking to uh, Roger, and I explained the whole story, and Randy said, I live on Beverly. And so we decided that we would attempt to do it because Randy, like me, has always had an interest, I guess, in street names, in the history of why they're named. So that was our broad introduction. We thought it would take, honestly, three months. <clears throat> we already had six streets. Uh, six months tops, and now we are here three years later <laughs> with it almost being completed. So, and then Randy and I, our first thing, uh, the first thing we did is we met and we decided what our intent would be. And I'll turn it over to you, Randy. Thanks. Uh, before I get into that, I can tell uh, Tom mentioned how uh, I grew up on Beverly Road, and I think one of your um, members, Lauren Longley, Lauren lived right across the street from me. Anyway, during the course of this, I had the ability to meet Beverly Hay. And I can tell you, having grown up on Beverly Road, my folks still live on that, I thought I was in the presence of royalty. <laughs> the intent was to find out the history of the road. Secondly, to find out why the name had, or why the road had the name that it did. And thirdly, the story behind that name. That's basically the broad uh, overview of uh, the purpose for which we uh, approached each of the uh, names. In order to do that, we went to a number of sources. Tom's already mentioned um, George's book, and in a lot of respects, George's book was our starting point. And for the record, we never corrected anything in George's book, we just amended it on occasion. <laughs> George was a wonderful guy. We, of course, went to the uh, Sarnia history books, some of, some of which George wrote, uh, Miss Alford, uh, she wrote, there were some other ones. We, uh, the Sarnia Observer Index, the Sarnia Observer uh, Publications, the Sarnia Journal Publications, the Historical Society's Index. We spent a lot of time at the registry office. 
and our good friend Alan Byrne, who knows everything about Sarnia as far as property titles go. He was uh, uh, invaluable to us as far as researching. City archives, city directories, cemetery records, obituaries, and uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, authoritative sites from uh, the computers as well. Um, in addition, Tom will tell you the probably the most important part of our research. Thanks, Randy. Uh, one other aspect that we used too was we uh, contacted Ancestry and we contacted people through Ancestry to provide any information. And as Randy mentioned with the intent, um, not only why the street was named, but we wanted to flesh out if information existed as to uh, why, who this person was after whom the street was named. And for certainly some of the uh, older streets, um, we had to dig a lot of information up uh, from records. But for modern streets, uh, right from the beginning, Randy and I uh, knew that in the 1950s, um, there were probably not great records being kept. So we knew that if there were any obscure streets or streets that were going to be difficult to find the origin of the name, it would probably be from the 50s. A lot of people had passed away. Um, and that turned out to be true, actually. But we knew from the beginning that it had to be a community project. Um, and it was, and it turned out we're happy to report. We talked to or emailed, uh, received emails uh, from people in Europe, uh, in Asia. These are all people who had connections to Sarnia throughout probably 13 or 14 of the states from Western Canada, from the Yukon. Uh, and, but most importantly, we spoke to people. And the local media was instrumental in helping us. Uh, the Sarnia Observer, the Sarnia Journal, they would publish some of our findings. They would talk about some of the streets that we needed. They would ask if uh, anyone could contact us at our www.streetsofsarnia at gmail.com and people would respond. So in the end, we had over 500 people who contributed somehow to this project. Randy and I always considered ourselves just the people who amassed the information that people provided. But it is true that um, some of the streets we solved, you wouldn't find anything electronically, it wouldn't be on the net. It was someone making a call and saying, my uncle named that street because. And some of the streets, for instance, um, Sylvia, we'd have no idea. Echo, uh, Rand Randy will talk to you about Echo, he grew up there. Hollywood, Flamingo, Clarendon, uh, Mala, uh, uh, several uh, other streets, to tell you the truth. Um, and we, we just decided that, yeah, that would be it. Even the true nature of the story, like a lakeside or lake view, they, they, it's not beyond just living near a lake. So that's how people really did help us. And it was persistent. Sometimes people just gave us a call, and they would say, I don't know the answer, but I could go to so-and-so. And in some cases, you'd have to call seven or eight people. I think I counted 32 calls that I made to be able to find out um, what was the name of the street? It was down by, uh, God, it's, it's left me now, but it's right down by Missioner. And some were easy. You may have read in the obituary that Al Charge passed away. Mm -hmm. Recently, Al was over 100 years old, but talking to Al was fascinating. As it was ta fascinating talking to Ivan Mater, because they gave us all sorts of information about not only the streets they developed, but leads as to future streets. And so um, that's just how we relied on people. And Sarnia, as Randy and I both know, is an extremely generous community in many ways. And this project wouldn't have been done without the help of 500 people. And we relied solely on these people. At this point, does anyone have any questions before we continue? Okay. Randy? Go ahead. <clears throat> should indicate that uh, during the times that we would sit down with families, you know, occasionally somebody would uh, say, now that street's named after Uncle Joe. And then they would pro uh, proceed to give us all the dirt on Uncle Joe. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, they always said, don't put that in your book. <laughs> we, we always uh, respected their request. Um, what we thought we would do is uh, go through some uh, streets 
Um, Tom mentioned about it. We're just going to highlight a few streets in uh, <clears throat> Echo Street. Uh, Tom will give you the details, but basically it was named by a lady who owned the property. Does everybody know where Echo is? She's lost right over here, right? And uh, she named it after the Echo, a kid's playing. And there used to be a ravine that ran from Merrill Road right up to Michigan, basically. And there was a creek that ran through with frogs. And anyways, I grew up in that neighborhood. And of course, I used to kill frogs in there. And we used to toboggan in there and all that type of thing. And she named it after the echo of the kids playing in there. And I said to Tom, I, I might have been one of those kids. <laughs> one of the, we, there were a couple of streets that uh, we really had a lot of fun with. Um, and which were uh, very challenging. One was Divine Street. I ended up doing these work on Divine Street, despite the fact that Tom grew up on Divine Street. And, you know, our initial reaction was, you know, you got a pile of churches on Divine Street. But it turned out that Divine Street's history started back in 1867 with Plan 16 and a half. That was one of the bigger plans that, uh, I think it was Vital's plan, that was one of them anyways. And uh, so most of the churches, of course, were built after that. So that wiped out the question of uh, the churches, at least the ones that uh, are in existence right now. George Smith had it that it was named after one of the early settlers in the area. Uh, Gene Elford had it that uh, it was named after a prominent Sarnia family. Well, we checked and whether it's the registry office or the old historical or the city directories, and we couldn't find um, any family that owned property on Divine Street. Couldn't find any divine that lived on Divine Street. Couldn't find any prominent family in Sarnia with the name Divine. There were very few divines in Sarnia at that time. And uh, of the divines that were in town, they were somewhat transient. They, they didn't hang around that long. And when you take a look at the historical names back in the 1860s of the streets, of course, it's named after prominent people in town, whether you're talking Vital and Cameron and, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, so we kept scratching our head over Divine. And we came to the conclusion that perhaps, and the emphasis on the perhaps, because we never got anything definitive on that, but at the intersection of Christina and Divine, just west of that intersection, everybody can picture that. That's, of course, where the original church was, the, the uh, missionary church. And that was the original church in Sarnia and was the most significant in the number of years. Um, <coughs> Vital's uh, uh, father-in-law, Mrs. she's buried there. That's where, the, that's where the folks went to the church. It was a joint church. It was a, an indigenous church, but it was also a lay person's church. It seemed by uh, the practice. We uh, came across a number of articles which indicated that the blue blood of Sarnia would go to that church and would celebrate at that church. So we thought, well, maybe Divine uh, was in relation to that church. And... But, of course, divine in a church sense is D-I-V-I-N-E, not D-E-V-I-N-E. But we came across uh, one of the authoritative dictionaries which said that D-E-V-I-N-E is often the misspelling of D-I-V-I-N-E. So we felt comfortable at least to throw that out as a possibility. That uh, still, we still don't have a definitive uh, answer to it. If anybody can find out what divine is really about, apart from our theory, we'd be pleased to buy you a coffee. <laughs> okay, we, we worked on that one, and uh, but that's you know that's just the nature of it. So, you know, Tom. I can tell you from firsthand experience, and in this case observation, Randy spent many hours um, compiling all the information that he passed off in a couple of minutes. It was fairly uh, painstaking work. And uh, about Echo Road, um, if it had not been for Priscilla Harkins, and Priscilla, I, did, 
I never want to guess a lady's age, but Priscilla. She's 93 or past. Thank you. My, my, my son-in-law is Matthew or Daniel Harkins. Oh her, gosh. Well, okay. Well, Priscilla called, and she, it was her mother Myrtle who named it, and she was looking out, and she said if she ever purchased land from William Giffel, uh, who owned the property at the time, that she was going to name it Echo because uh, people like Randy were running around and ruining her sleep, probably. Uh, <laughs> And about Divine Street, Randy's right. If we didn't know, we decided right from the beginning, if we didn't know for sure, we would provide as much information as we could about a street, and we would throw out some possible solutions. Which brings me, perhaps, to Robin Lane, to give you an example. Robin Lane is a very small... Does anyone know where Robin Lane is? It's a, just a small connecting street, four houses... In fact, one of the four was one of the original dream homes of Sarnia in 1951, I believe. Mm -hmm. But where Robin Lane came from, well, it was around the same time that Randy and I were trying to figure out Hollywood and Flamingo, and we spent many hours surmising it. And I'll let Randy talk about um, Flamingo in a second in Hollywood. But about Robin Lane, it was... Um, we don't know after what it was named. When I say what, Robin was not a who. We know that for sure. Uh, John Clad was the person who developed this tiny subdivision, so it was Robin Lane in Valleyfield, and he developed it uh, probably in uh, roughly 19, I believe, 48 to 50. Um, Devonshire had just been there, so maybe it was a bit later. Maybe it was 1952. But Devonshire had a few houses on it, so this is how the story goes, and perhaps it gives you a, an idea of how we, um, how we found things. Uh, so um, Robin Lane was pretty well a dead end. John Clad had passed away. His wife, Christina, had passed away. Uh, they were from Holland originally. They moved to Kamlaki. He was a painter. They moved in, and they lived on a, uh, the farmhouse on North Christina, which at the time was Woodrow. Uh, that was what Christina Street was called. Yes? Woodrow Road or Woodrow Ave? I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> I remember it as Woodrow Road, having yeah. lived on 1302. But I see in the documentation here it says Woodrow Ave. I do not know, to be honest with you. Uh, Maybe I, you have some envelopes. Oh, interesting. I don't know. It was uh, after the, the the street that eventually became Woodrow, right? Okay. Right. Uh, Back then, I just know it was called Woodrow, but I'm not sure what it is. I could probably find out because I have one of Where the plans. Where did Woodrow start? Pardon me? Where did Woodrow start? The old Woodrow? I thought it started at Michigan. That sounds right. Yeah, I think so. I, I'm not for sure, but I, I've seen plans that said that. So at the time, the clouds lived there, um, and then by the time we got around to it, um, the clouds are long gone. Uh, but I happen to know the people who lived in the farmhouse who happened to have the obituary of Mr. and Mrs. Clad that also had the, um, that also had um, a, a name, the name of the granddaughter. So I managed to get a hold of the granddaughter who talked to uh, Mrs. Clad, and Mrs. Clad basically said, sorry, it was the great granddaughter talking to the, the granddaughter who grew up here, and she said, as far as she knew, there was nothing significant. And then I got a call from my optometrist, who's a good friend of mine. He said a lady came in, and she said she knows the origin of Robin Lane, and no one else does. I said, could you find out her name? He said, sure. He contacted her. Well, 12 months later, she came back for another appointment. He said, did you ever uh, contact my friend who's doing this project? And she said, no, I forgot. So I contacted her, and actually her husband. He said, oh yeah, 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 Robin Lane. We know for sure it was named after a dog. <laughs> On Devonshire, there was a lady um, who is still living there whose name escapes me now. But she was one of the original residents on Devonshire. She said across the street from her were the McLeans. So Mr. McLean was a contractor in London, but he did some work in Sarnia. But they had a dog named Robin. And Robin used to run all the way around. And so... We accepted that. Uh, well, first of all, uh, under the premise, why would someone make this up? And secondly, it had to be feasible. So Randy and I prepared the document, and then um, 
two weeks, maybe, sorry, two days before it's set to go <laughs> to the city website, uh, a lady called who had been one of the original owners of a house on Robin Lane. And I guess if we were to add any more information to the document, that means that everything else has to be reset. And so uh, I thought about it and I said, yeah, well, we could, I, we could ignore what this lady was going to say, but that wouldn't be fair to her because she actually contacted another owner on Robin Lane who was living in Florida who was maybe approaching 93, and she said basically, well, I can tell you that Robin Lane was not named after a dog. She said, our driveway, or excuse me, our, our backyard, they, they, my backyard backed onto the backyard shared by Mrs. Clad. And we would often meet at the clotheslines, and she would say, well, look at all the Robins in this neighborhood. She said, in fact, this little laneway that eventually became Robin Lane was just a dirt path then. It was known as Robin Lane for that very reason, of all the Robins there. So, following our policy of presenting every, uh, every possible explanation, we can tell you that Robin Lane is named for a living creature, whether it be a dog or a bird. We, we really don't know, but it's one of those two, I would think. Um, uh, the granddaughter of Mrs. Um, Mrs. Clad was adamant that there was no Robin in the family, so we know that for sure. Well, those are just some examples of, you wouldn't find them in a history book, but one that we could find in, in history is one that probably, um, I guess, Randy, this might be next to not find the divide. Uh, we both had research on Russell Street. In Russell Street, um, the accepted theory for years was that it was named after George Russell, who was indeed a local brewer in Sarnia in the 1860s up until the mid-1870s. And uh, he, was a, uh, he was a deputy reeve. This is historical fact in 1866. And the theory was that he used his position and influence as deputy reeve and his profit from this brewery that he was, uh, he, bought all sorts of streets, or excuse me, properties along the street that eventually became his name, Russell Street. And um, it's the point now where the public school board at a certain point when they went to name what is now, um, what is the name of the school after uh, the new school in the, the old um, Johnson Memorial? Polly, Polly, Polly McGibbon. Yeah. Polly McGibbon, they didn't have Polly McGibbon as the first, as the first possibility. Uh, they wanted, perhaps, as a compromise, the board said, well, why don't we name it Russell Street Memorial? And some parents got upset because they said, let's not name it Russell Street Memorial because it would be an injustice to have our children influenced by someone who was a beer baron. <laughs> so this, the name was rejected on that premise. Now, the unfortunate fact is that Russell Street was not named for George Russell the Brewer. And, in fact, I write a trivia column for the journal, and you try to try to be accurate with your questions, but one of the local questions, and there have to be two for each each uh, column, was what was the occupation of George George Russell, after whom Russell Street is named, and they gave four, and the answer is brewery. So, the following Saturday, I meet a, again, this is Sarnia's community connection, I meet a uh, friend of mine, Jack Howden, and Jack was born in England, and he said about your trivia, he said, I like it, but you better check out Russell Street because you ain't got it right. And I am quoting Jack, and he's a very literate man. You ain't got it right. So Randy and I started checking, and Jack was indeed right because it just doesn't add up. Uh, we came across um, plan number 14.5, which was, as it's dated 1853-1854, and there named on it was Russell Street. Now... The problem is a few things. One, George Russell, again, the, the census shows it, was born in 1840. Okay? For a 13-year-old who wasn't even in Sarnia at that time to have a street named after him was pretty well impossible. The street was named well before he actually did come to Sarnia. Uh, as well, Malcolm Cameron was the voice of temperance, and it ran right through his property. So... <coughs> For him to name it after someone who dabbled in beer, it just wouldn't work. 
So Cameron is an interesting study. So he named several streets after family members. Kalina, which is now a college. He named uh, Christina after his wife, who's another study in herself, actually. Uh, and he named Lachiel after his clan. But he also named some after statesmen. Cromwell, Wright, Cobden, the anti-corn law reformers. But then he named Palmerston and did Russell. Now, prior to Jack Howden, he mentioned this, I'd never heard of a prime minister, John Russell from England, but there was, and he was a reformer. It was right around, around the time of Cameron. So everything points to the fact that it was named after Prime Minister Russell and not George Russell, the beer baron. Uh, that's what we found out, and I think we're, we're correct in our assumptions. But if we thought perhaps that we wouldn't be, then we wouldn't have mentioned it. <coughs> Does anyone have any questions at all? Or? Okay. Then? I kind of have a question. Yes. Since you now know that it wasn't named after the George Russell, did you also notate that in your book, that it you thought it was, but now it's not? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we did. We, well, Randy will talk about this. Okay. Yes, I can go ahead, Randy. That uh, Russell one was fun because uh, we came across some of the stories about when they were trying to name the school. Man, some people had their shirt in a knot over that one. It was, kind of, it was kind of fun to kind of blow that one out of the water a little bit. I think George Madison had a few editorial comments on that one as well. One of my favorite uh, streets, uh, and I think Tom would agree with me, the story behind it, it was in 1892, the street was developed and uh, set out in the plan in the south end of town. And uh, eventually, they had trouble selling the lots. And eventually, the uh, developer, Richard McLaren, changed the name of the street to McLaren after himself. And, you know, remember, um, Sarnia was so heavily Scottish in those days. They were probably scratching their head over why they couldn't sell the lots. Well, as it turned out that, uh, based on the original name, not many people wanted to live on Athol Street. <laughs> Which, of course, is a county in, uh, in a region in Scotland. Uh, Flamingo was an interesting story. When Flamingo was developed in the um, 50s, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, some, of the, some of the citizens of the town got a little excited about it because they didn't feel that uh, the name uh, after a pink bird was really a Sorry. And the matter ended up being in front of city council. And about what powers, if any, should the city be able to uh, exercise as far as naming city streets? Because up to that point in time, the streets were na normally named by either the developer or the surveyor. And uh, they had a big brouhaha in, uh, at uh, city council there. And uh, one of the councilwomen, uh, Donahue, she said that as far as she was concerned, if a contractor wanted to name the street after her, his Aunt Emma, then he should be able to. And that kind of set the precedent. And to this day, generally speaking, the names of the streets are named by the developers or their surveyors or, mm -hmm. or their lawyers sometimes, that type of thing. Yeah. Good. Okay. And again, Flamingo, um, Marcel Blaise hadn't called us, and it was his mother who named it because his stepfather, Harvey Lelong, uh, was the one who developed it. Hollywood, <laughs> Randy and I would often speculate where the origins came from, but Hollywood was named after Hollywood, Florida, because on their trips often, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lelong uh, would travel there, and it was one of their favorite cities. Um, but it was out there, and Randy mentioned Flamingo as being unacceptable. This is about the time that uh, Sarnia annexed property in 1951 because of the expanding borders, uh, surging population, and so a lot of names had to be duplicated. So that's why John Street had to be changed, Cameron Street had to be changed, and you started getting streets beyond the normal common realm, but Flamingo was out there. Ironically, Robin Lane, named after another bird, was named two years earlier, so no one really objected to that. So it's interesting. Beacon Lane was named simply, they would ask a resident, and it was a Mrs. Hare who named it because of uh, 
the uh, lighthouse in in um, Port Huron. And the fellow who gave me the information said, if you don't believe it, come back here at night. So I did. And sure enough, on Beacon Lane, it is a powerful beam of light. Dr. McMillan was instrumental in uh, providing uh, housing for uh, during the wartime, or after during this wartime explosion of people, and after, I should say, he was instrumental in providing uh, middle-class families with lots by the lake. Uh, he was quite an interesting character. Uh, another person who would be very interesting, Randy alluded to Mrs. Mitten. Uh, she was 80 years old when she came over here. Now, that's an arduous journey, but at 80 years old to leave a very comfortable lifestyle in uh, the west part of London, England, and to travel all this way to come to Sarnia, which had a population of what in 1834? Would it be 50? 50 people? A couple of hotels. Uh, uh, we really wanted to dwell, so we wrote a lot about George Duran, we wrote a lot about Malcolm Cameron, um, we wrote a lot about Richard Vidal, um, we wrote about Mariah Vidal and why it's called Mariah as opposed to Maria. Um, recently, uh, Christina Cameron, we always thought, you know, if we could find something that would be memorable of these people, but she had a fairly miserable life. She was diagnosed at the age of 45 with rheumatoid arthritis. She was an invalid for um, the remainder of her years, but out of desperation, if you could think about it, they offered her one slim hope if she went to Baden-Baden, Germany, where the therapeutic waters of these spas could possibly cure her, and they didn't. But what's nice to know about Christina Cameron is you could put a face to her personality. Uh, people marveled and were awed by her selfless nature, how she um, faced such uh, pain and suffering with such uh, nobility, and she was more concerned with others than, um, than herself. In fact, there was quite a funeral when she was, uh, came back to Sarnia, she died in Ottawa, but the uh, mayor at the time, Mayor Gerd, asked that every shop in Sarnia be closed during her funeral. So we tried to find something about the people behind the street names as opposed to just giving a name as much as we could. And we're, we weren't completely successful, as Randy's going to tell you. Does anyone have any questions at all? I got just a, a couple more uh, <clears throat> points as we get talking. You know, you think about things. Everybody knows where College Street is. Well, that was originally Richard Street. Everybody knows where Brock is. That's next street west. That originally was Emmerich, and of course the next street west was Vital. And if they had street signs back in those days, and if you were coming in from London east to west, the streets would have read Richard Emmerich Vital after old Mr. Vital. Um, I don't know how many people know, the Vitals were surveyors as well. I don't know if that's uh, generally well known, but they were actually surveyors as well. And uh, <clears throat> while we're talking about Mrs. Mitten, bless her heart, Mrs. Mitten was the first adult non-Indigenous person to be buried at the old uh, mission that we've already referred to. Well, as it turned out, uh, she was buried there with two other um, infants, two infants non-indigenous infants. One of the infants was reinterred when they built Lakeview Cemetery. The other infant wasn't. <clears throat> Neither was Mrs. Metton. And uh, everybody uh, familiar with Charlotte Nisbet, she, uh, she used to write a lot of history columns back in the 40s for the Sarnia Observer. Well, she was Senator Vidal's granddaughter. So she had first-hand knowledge of all this stuff, and apparently when they opened up the Lakeview Cemetery, Senator Vidal announced to the family that uh, he was going down and getting Grandma and moving her, moving her to Lakeview. But apparently Senator Vidal went somewhere, came back and announced to the family that she was not to be found. Now, don't want to be cynical, <coughs> but I, I just can't picture Senator Vidal with his top hat with a pickaxe going down there looking and successfully digging up grandma. Perhaps she did, but that kind of defies the laws of uh, human uh, deterioration. Um, but those are the stories that, you know, we came across as we were doing this. They're just kind of interesting. You know, it's just the interesting part of the, uh, 
uh, of the history. We missed, I don't know, how many, how many we missed, 20 maybe? 20. 20. We made a list of the main ones there. Yeah. yeah. If anybody can help us on that. We've, we've officially, um, when we were all done, we turned the matter over to the city. We, read, we made a gift of the project to the city, and it's on the city website now, and it's on the historical society's website now, so if you ever want to go to it and check it out, and that would be uh, that would be wonderful. We basically, however, after we did that, we got such a response that we decided we'd do an update on it uh, with fresh information that we got. So we did an update for, and that update is incorporated onto what is now on the city website. We're kind of effectively out of business at this point in time. Um, maybe some would-be historian can take over from us old guys um, and uh, continue it on at some point in time. But uh, it's uh, we did, uh, but out of 700, we were pretty satisfied at getting them all, but about 20. That was, uh, we were quite satisfied with that. Yes, madam. Yes. Did you ever do anything um, on the Lane name? I see you've got written here. Langdon, a uh, person named Langdon used to have a lot of property in where Hastings Street was <coughs> in the road near Bridgman Side Road. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, that land was held in escrow for a very long time. And I moved on, and eventually Hastings was all developed and everything. But, but I don't understand the reason why it was held. Maybe Langdon Street was named for him if he was a developer. I don't know. He owned a large piece of property. It was, the street was developed in 1966 um, by Block Anderson, um, so um, we, well, just a, as a twist, we should mention that Randy and I were about a year late because we met with Block uh, Anderson's, Mr. Block Anderson's widow, and she said, oh, I threw out all these file folders a year ago on information on the streets, so... Uh, we were a bit late, but I'm not sure. Uh, perhaps someone could follow that up. We don't know. There, again, there were few langs in the in the area, and the street explanation was that it was named after a family in the area. But we did talk to the Harkins family, we talked to the Severn family, and we talked to the Giffel family, and they had never heard of anyone called Lang. Yeah, owning property in there, and the street search, show, street search showed that there was no one named Lang at the time that the street was developed in 66. Well, this guy's name was Lang Den. Lang Den. Yes, I, that's his, I don't know, yes. Um, I know there's more than one Lang family that they're not related. I, I, my second or third great grandmother <coughs> is Lang. And they are separate from some of the Langs that are currently in Sarnia. Okay. Uh, I, I guess I was referencing the name Lang in 1966. I'm just... Oh. I was just okay. saying that I know right. there's more than one Lang family that right. are not apart, like, not right. together. Like. Right. And I think for Lang... We might never know, just as we might not know about Toro, any of these streets, because uh, in the late 50s, um, it wasn't only Sarnia builders, it was now corporations who were building subdivisions. That's the first thing. And secondly, um, who knows why a street was named? So, for instance, if we hadn't found Priscilla Harkins, we wouldn't know about Echo. If we hadn't found Sylvia Durant, we wouldn't know about Sylvia. So they may have named it after... Anything. Well, I can give you one here that we had no idea. We even talked to the person who named most of the streets in Twin Lakes. It was John, the late John Krapko's um, former son-in-law, and his name is Jerry. His last name escapes me. But he lives in Alabama now. So I called him, and he actually works at an airport in Alabama. And uh, he gave uh, Randy and me about a half hour of his time, but he named... The origin of every street in Twin Lakes, and you know where Esser came from. He didn't mention Tawny, but Randy found that out from a friend of his. Uh, he didn't know about Daly, and he didn't know about Maynard. And so we thought, well, maybe a lot of the streets were named after colleges and universities, you know, 
bishops, um, um, well, Laurentian, that perhaps it was named after a, a colleague's name, Maynard, but it wasn't. It was named after, and this has been verified by someone who was at the meeting, a friend of my wife's called and said, you want to find out about Maynard? My sister-in-law knows. So I called his sister-in-law, and she said, yeah, Maynard. It was named after Maynard Seabolt. I said, well, excuse my ignorance. I'd never heard of Maynard Seabolt. I was, I'm sure he's never heard of Tom St. Amon. And he said Maynard Seabolt was an electrician. And it turns out that he lived on Seoul Street. That doesn't have anything to do with it. But he was doing some of the wiring for some of the houses in Twin Lakes. And this panel of people couldn't decide what to name this little street. And Maynard Seabolt stuck his head in and almost as a joke said, you can name it after me if you want. And they said, Maynard it is. <laughs> I mean, how, how else would you, you know, how else are you going to know that? One of the streets, uh, I, I can't recall the street Tom will remember, was named after uh, um, uh, the furnaces. That oh, they put Rex. In the, Rex, yeah. yeah. And uh, I guess the guy said to the developer, he, you're buying all my furnaces, I'll give you a cut on the furnaces if you name the street after. So, there you go. Yeah. We think it's a real honor to have a street named after you. That's why it's a shame that some streets in Sarnia are misspelled and have caused some hard feelings among certain people. I can point out one. Um, Housen, I think it's Housen Avenue off Lakeshore, should actually be called Houston. I'm sorry, Houston should be called Housen. And the reason is that the Housen family... Charles Housen in the 50s owned the land in which it was developed and his name is on there and I know for a fact because his grandson called me and he said for years it has been called Houston and it should be Housen. So the grandfather Charles went to City Hall and they said basically well that's too bad. The next generation so this grandson so now the father went there by now it is probably the early 70s and City Hall's answer was, if you want to change it, then you have to go to every, every tenant, everyone who owns a house in that property, and you have to get their permission. And then you're going to have to investigate the changing of, well, think about it, your address, your driver's license, wherever on any formal official government document it would be changed. He said, well, that's just too much work, forget it. So I talked to the grandson, and he said, well, we regret it ever since because really it's, it's a 60 year old spelling mistake, which is unfortunate. Yes, sir? Is there any connection between Burr Street right there, Burr and Houston? Yes. I, I know that so, and somehow they are related. The Burrs, uh, we got the information from a Mr. Greg Burr, I believe, and we went on Ancestry, but Burr and there's Rowe Street around there too. Uh, they're all, they were all landowners around that time. Just like the Mills area, McGee and all that. They a lot of them were farmers, and they had uh, the farms that came off. The, it was like the the, the seniority system uh, along uh, the Saint Clair or Saint Lawrence River, mm -hmm. long, narrow farms, and that way you had more farms running on the waterfront. Right. Yeah. And they, they just had long was a those those were birds were family. Yes, sir. Something else that just occurred is Craig Street, which is off Lakeshore. Uh, what's the name of the street? Craig. Yep. Off Lakeshore. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually Craig Street when it was when it was uh, created. Apparently, it got moved about a hundred feet because the guy who owned that corner lot. I think his name. His name Is that you talking about in Bryce Grove off there, Craig Street? No, one? no. Lakeshore Mur Murphy, Lakeshore West, uh, Lakeshore East, the first street east of Mission of uh, Murphy, off Lakeshore. First Street East of Murphy. Anyway, the gentleman died last year, unfortunately. Oh. I, I remember talking to him oh. in the yard uh, just uh, a couple is it, years is ago, it, telling me that that street, the corner, he got a corner lot because it used to run through his property, and he got the agree to oh. move the actual street oh. over. I wonder where Craig Street. <laughs> That's influence. From. Is it Craig Street or is that Gray Street? Is it Craig Street? Craig. Oh. We may have missed that one. Really. I know there's a Craig Street out and named after uh, Craig Haney. That's out in Bright's Grove. Um, now this uh, is the first street off Lakeshore past Murphy when you go to the east. To the east. Is there many houses on that street? Oh, yeah. There's, there's a couple of dozen. Okay. I just wondered. There, there are some uh, privately uh, private lanes that are not 
serviceable streets. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a straight through street to yeah. Dell behind, I think it is. To Dell? Well, that, oh, that's, well, that's, that's, um, that was uh, Guy Simpson's area, right? Guy Simpson and uh, no. Rutherglen. You had, you're heading out towards Rutherglen, right? Right, yeah, right? Before you get to Rutherglen, it's on... Well, I need my map book. There's the Willard. I need my map book. Clarendon? Is that uh, uh, Clarendon's farther up. That's in Bright's Grove. Does anyone have a city map? I'm just trying to picture that street. I know there was uh, Gray Street was around there, named after Charles Grace. That ran into Dell. Yeah. Around there, I, I, yeah, would be the last. But it's it is quite a, except for the 50s when they did the amalgamation and streets had to be, street names had to be changed. It is, it is tough. So there's a little street right at the end of. Uh, right at the end of Murphy, so north of Lakeshore. And it's the first street on the left, and it's in one way. I'm sorry, not, not Craig, Carl. 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 Yeah, Carl. I, yeah. I, I live there. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh. The guy who owns the corner property, he died last year. Oh, that would be John. Um, is right, he was a real. Uh, He's been there since the early fifties. Yes, his. Uh, anyway, we can look it up, but I, I know I know of whom you so speak. So where does that come from? I think Carl comes from. Uh, I don't want to say it's not Carl Fleck. It's right in there, Randy Carl. Okay. And we. It was his wife used to roam around there in a golf cart, but oh, yeah. they didn't live there that long. Um, Everything you want it, need to know is uh, in this thing here. He yeah. said he bought the property there in '52, and there was yeah. just a field behind. I, it, I, I so talked to that. I talked to that. Named gentleman. after William Carl Tripp, born Carl in Nipissing, Tripp. 1906, yeah. came to Sarnia in the 1950s. Wow. Yes. Right. Okay. So this is this is the book, by the way. Uh, we aren't sure if it's ever going to get into print. Uh, Randy and I. Uh, have not not made a cent from this, nor do we wish to make a cent. Uh, we aren't sure. Uh, there's no doubt that more people would read this if it was uh, in print copy, but you can find a very good um, version of it on the City Hall website or the Sarnia Historical website. Uh, if it does go into print, and we aren't really sure if that will happen, then we would ask members of the local press if they could just advertise it. And... That's it. But there are tons of streets we could talk about, but we don't want to bore you any further. Does anyone have any more questions? Yes? I grew up on Vimy Crescent yeah. in Carnation Park. Now, I always thought that was named for Vimy Ridge. I think it's named for the Governor General. That's the story, because that's where all the Governors General mm -hmm. are, are named, mm -hmm. I believe. Well, there's Massey and Gray Crescent. And yeah. Coronation Lower Park, Grant, Coronation Park yeah. right? That's that's governor. that's where that's where Vimy came from because there was a governor general. Oh, okay. Something of Vimy. Okay. So it had nothing to do with Vimy Ridge. As far as we know, it no, did no, not. I mean, it would be just, consistent. We're just I going just on what that. we were told. Okay. Wasn't uh, um, Bing? Bing? Wasn't Bing uh, Lord Vimy? Could be. Bing, we'll if it was. For you, there we go. There's instant research right here. No, no, no answers. While Randy's doing that, does anyone have any further? Yes? Uh, can you tell me the origins of the um, tree streets? Who started? Uh, I well, <laughs> uh, Lord Bing was uh, Vimy. And Bing, of course, was uh, the head of the, uh, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces at Vimy. They were the boys. They were called Bing's boys because they, they just loved the guy. And of course, his wife was the Lady Bing Trophy in the NHL. And he was he was a British aristocrat, but he was by the time we were done, he was at least half Canadian. So. And you asked about the the tree, tree street. Tree street. Uh, according to this, just reading here, this register plan 111. So in the eight, 1940s, these houses were built to accommodate the surging population of Sarnia. And um, the street is unofficially known as the Tree Streets, but it was actually called the Eastview Subdivision. And it wasn't uncommon back then for streets to be named after trees based on the importance of lumber in Sarnia's history. And it's a fairly safe name. But you're talking about oak, elm, hickory. 
Yeah, that's Secret one of those subdivisions that have a, a theme. We used to call it the Veterans Subdivision. Well, it was yes. built, it was built for veterans coming yeah, home. Yeah, that's what we... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right after the war, like there was a surge of building in Sarnia right yeah. after the war. And uh, it, it was named, uh, or pardon me, it was developed because of the demand of the guys coming back. Yeah, and they got cheaper or special mortgages yep. or something like that. VLA, it's called VLA date. Yeah. Veteran Land Act. And when you came back, if you're a veteran, you, you, you had a benefit. You got two benefits. You go to school, uh, and get your tuition in that paid, or you could get a plot of land. And they call those the VLA deeds. Yeah. And I know Sarnia, um, about the street names, has started to, but probably not as much as they wanted to. In 1993, there was a decision made that they would make they would name some streets after Sarnia's Fallen. So, so far, only five streets have been named after Sarnia's Fallen. So there's Eddy Drive right along Highway Drive. There's uh, Burger Drive. There's Quinn. There's uh, Wheatley. And there is Barkley. Those are the only five. And I know that um, there are not a lot of streets being built in Sarnia right now. Um, but there are some family members of fallen soldiers who are asking that streets be named after the fallen one in their family. And I don't know what the protocol is. Perhaps you do, Randy, for choosing what veteran's name is put onto a street. I, 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 I don't believe there is one. Yeah. I think it's still up to the contractor. And, uh, we've, uh, we've often been asked, you know, our views on naming streets and stuff like that. We've always taken a non-political, you know. Yeah. Other people know better than us, but if we did have one inclination, it would be that some streets be named after the poem. You yes, see when Charlesworth was made and when it was named? Pardon me? Charlesworth, you say when it was made and when it was named? Was it uh, wasn't always Charlesworth. Place? It was called Lakeview when it was named okay. east of Colburn, but it was, from what we understand, it was named after a developer in the area who didn't spend a lot of time in Sarnia. His name was Otto Leo Charlesworth. And Leo Charlesworth um, named a few of the streets in there. Well, Charlesworth so, comes through to Christina, but that wasn't part of the original Charlesworth? Uh, yes. It, uh, well, actually, it had a name before that, but I don't know what it is. Okay. It Chippican was Boulevard. Chippican Boulevard. Then it became Charlesworth. And then once it came to Colburn, it was originally called Lake something, I believe, and that was switched then to Charlesworth. Yeah, it's but a train, train history. Leo, right? yeah, yeah, Leo Charlesworth was into horses. So Devonshire is named after a famous racetrack. Um, Roosevelt's named after a famous racetrack. Egmond, uh, boy, well, that's either named after this, the village that he came from, Egmondville, or his wife's name, or his father's name, or someone named Van Egmond. But it's, there's a connection there. E east of Colburn, uh, ch what is now Charlesworth, was known as Lakeview Street. Lakeview Street. Well, I'm talking about West of Colburn. Yeah, West of Colburn, Colburn. is Chippewa and Boulevard. Yeah. Yeah. Chippewa and Boulevard. At one point. Yeah. 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 You know, you know, there were several surprises for people. So, for instance, uh, Braemar is north of Murphy, and it's the first street on the left. In fact, it's just north, I guess, of the... <laughs> Uh, the um, cemetery there, the Hyde Kemsley Cemetery. But a Mr. Kemsley owned property at the corner. And for sure, it, it's just a narrow lane, for sure, when it was going to be officially named in the 50s, it was going to be called Kemsley. There's no doubt about it. And then someone from City Hall, the story goes, according to a former resident of Braemar Lane, someone at City Hall with an affection for everything Scottish named it Braemar after that section of Scotland that he liked to vacation in. So they were a bit shocked when they got to Braemar. People hated it, but that's what they stuck with. Okay. Yes. I, I've always understood that Kensley, Townsend, and Haight were family relatives they were. together. Uh, for I don't know. Who was the second one? Uh, Tom. Kemsley's, Townsend's, and uh, Haight. The Kemsley's and the Haight's were for sure. I'm not sure about the Townsend's. You're probably right. But they, uh, yeah, they, 
they were definitely related. Yeah, um, folks, if that's all the questions, if that's all the questions, we'd like to thank you very much for uh, having us.